Hello everyone, welcome to the Moodle Moot uh, 2022, super excited to be here. So my name is Andrew Bogue, I'm the CEO of Catalyst Canada and Catalyst Australia. This talk is about a very exciting project we were involved with that had a bit of COVID, a bit of Moodle and a bit of proctoring involved and high stakes assessment. And I'll be presenting with Sandra Gabriel. Um, hi everybody, my name is Sandra Gabriel. I'm the Vice Provost for Innovation and Teaching and Learning at Concordia University, which is a comprehensive university in Montreal in Canada. So, where we go? Yeah. so just the term coal is what the system was uh, called. It, coal was a dedicated Moodle instance. Concordia University has been a Moodle uh, unit, has been a Moodle university for quite some time. They have a Moodle for learning delivery, but the Cole instance of Moodle along with some other technologies was a dedicated instance of Moodle for exam delivery, assessment delivery. So Concordia online exams. It was a collection of technologies, uh, both a dedicated Moodle instance 3.9 with some extensions from Monash University, which we'll talk about in a wee bit. It was on a high availability AWS cloud platform provided by us. It was also using Proctorio um, proctoring. They're actually here, so you know that that's one of the proctoring tool sets, as well as other technologies such as AWS Connect for telephony and communication and some BI tools and various other things. So just a bit of context is that in 2019, uh, you know, before, in the before, Catalyst had decided to move to, um, to start up some branches in Canada. We had some business opportunities there, we like Canada. Uh, we, before that we were Australia, New Zealand um, and the EU. So after a, sort of a period of trips and some journeys and some planning and some strategy and some business development, we decided to move and start Open a Canada office. And that sort of kicked off just before uh, sort of March 2020, at which time the world all changed. I was there the last time before COVID in January 2020, very excited about the opportunity. We met with Sandra in Montreal and then everything sort of stopped. We had planned to send people to Canada at that point, but still we had opportunities that were looking interesting and we managed to pursue those. One thing I want to mention, which I won't talk too much about, but it is very important to understand, is the time zone difference. I believe the time zone difference between Australia and North America, well, the American continent in general, is the worst time zone difference out there, right? Because of the dateline, right? So you really don't want to use the words tomorrow, today, or yesterday when you're talking to someone across that dateline. There's only a four-day overlapping week. Short notice meetings are very, very, very challenging. There is essentially no overlapping uh, work time. I mean, Europe, Australia is tricky, but North America, well, the American content in Australia is worst of all. Um, and there's a, certain, there's a certain scenario that I had in the morning sometimes after waking up after a full day of Canada being when I was asleep, when I would open my phone and look at my phone and start scrolling at the emails sort of with one eye open. And if I had pages and pages and pages of emails about some uh, sort of incident or something that had happened, that was a very unfortunate way to start the day because it was all these things that I wasn't able to get involved in helping or solving because I was asleep. So that's a, it was an ongoing challenge given that we were delivering the project remotely on both sides. Um, just a quick talk as well about Monash University and how they fit into this engagement. So Monash University in 2018, uh, they started uh, work on an, an e-assessment delivery platform for in-person delivery, by the way, not for remote delivery. They were doing this inside a large hall, being invigilated, using um, some improvements to Moodle that include better word processing function, uh, better question types, some UX improvements. And that, was, that work was the basis by which uh, Cole was, was made in many ways. A lot of those enhancements were used. And that, that started with Monash in 2018. And that was something that Catalyst was involved in. So I'll hand over to Sandra. Um, so the background to this story really is that Andrew and I met in Dublin uh, in 2017. 2019. Really? 19. 19. Yeah. Um, and uh, we met at the online uh, learning conference, the World Online Learning Forum, I think it's called. Anyway, it was. We met for other reasons. Hey, we use Catalyst. That was the nature of the conversation. When COVID hit, I called up Andrew in a bit of a panic saying, 
Um, so COVID hit in March, so one little piece of context I should share is that we're on a tri trimester system um, at uh, Concordia, so our uh, exams were coming up. We shut down in March, exams were coming up in April. Um, and so we were trying to figure out what we would do short of canceling all of our examinations. We run um, a thousand plus exams every single uh, cycle, so we run a lot of exams. We have a lot of courses that run. We're maybe not the super most efficient university, but um, so so the point was that we called up Andrew and uh, Catalyst in a in a bit of a panic, saying, "What do we do?" Um, <clears throat> so by May, we were able to get this solution up and running. So yes, we missed our April, our April deadline. Um, and, uh, and what we did was we just ran our, Mo our regular Moodle site. Uh, there were other, um, using the, qu the quiz t uh, system, uh, and there were other s platforms that uh, other profs had already engaged that, uh, that were in use. And so um, by May, though, we were established. We had a contract in place. Well, maybe not completely signed. Andrew, if you've ever dealt with him, is maybe not the most quick on getting those contracts out to you. But regardless, we were already working together, getting the system um, established and in place. And we were, at that time, uh, in fact, licensing Menashe's tools. So the reason why Andrew wanted to uh, make sure that we mentioned Menashe was that we were, in fact, licensing uh, their platform initially um, with the goal that we were going to get our own up and running. And that happened um, by July of the following year. So um, needless to say, these were some of our core challenges. Uh, the, this is a very, very, very short list. Um, I could go on and on. I could spend the rest of the talk really um, fleshing out what these challenges were. You can well imagine that um, bringing in a brand new system that uh, our faculty hadn't used previously uh, was uh, a huge learning curve. And so what we did was in fact create um, an exam creation team. We didn't have that before. So uh, obviously when we were running exams in person, there was a whole system in place to support that with dropping off paper exams, et cetera. Um, and now what we were moving into um, uh, the online system, we needed a way for exams to be created uh, that could, that were, um, properly created, so it's, it's uh, really the most tragic and stressful situation when you discover that an exam has not been set up properly in the middle of the exam. Uh, and so we were you know, trying our very best to ensure that we were avoiding that. And so we actually created uh, a brand new uh, exam creation team to help in, uh, ensure that we had the right quality uh, assurance process in place. <clears throat> that was initially run uh, by Andrew's team, and then eventually Concordia took over that when we launched um, uh, 2.0. Um, and so the last thing I just wanted to say that um, Andrew and I had a lot of conversations about is this last point around the appropriate guidelines for implementation. I'll come back and speak to that in, in a minute, but I cannot overstate, and I. Andrew was the one who impressed this on me, and I'm perhaps, shockingly, because I'm an administrator, underestimated how important the guidelines were and continue to be now as we, as we uh, are moving into uh, some new territory where we're trying to ensure that all online experiences stay online. So if a student signs up for an online class, that their entire experience will stay online. Our profs have been very quick to jump back to an online course, but an in-person exam, which um, doesn't uh, have a ton of sense behind it uh, if, you're tr if you're a student trying to sustain an online experience. So this is just one example of some of the supports that we needed to create, and we had to build a ton of infographics, quick, easy ways to help our, our faculty and our students know and understand um, how to get in and use the system. Um, this was one of them that we decided on. I just want to mention that step two came in pretty quickly. I was the subject of a 35,000, I think, um, plus um, change.org petition. <laughs> I was named in the petition because I was just the face of it, uh, asking um, Concordia to stop using uh, all online proctoring during the exam uh, season, so that was really fun. 
Um, we uh, understood very well the um, discomfort that students had with the camera coming in. Um, we selected Proctorio or an automated proctoring system precisely because it didn't have a person behind it. Um, we weren't able to get our own uh, invigilators um, in place in time because we are a unionized university. We couldn't make that transition quick enough. Um, and so uh, we didn't want strangers in, in our students' bedrooms, uh, and we wanted to be sure that we could say that they were our employees, um, but we couldn't make that transition fast enough. So we went with um, an automated proctoring system. It had its ups and downs, um, and uh, I'll now say that we've run a survey with our students um, just in the spring, and we asked them to rank their um, preferred ways to take an exam, and so, from the context back in March of uh, 35,000 plus signatures asking us to stop using Proctorio, um, the second ranked um, option that the students selected was a proctored online exam. So the first was unproctored online and the second was a proctored online exam. So it really spoke to how, f how quickly our community moved over and became accustomed and much more at ease uh, with using the technology. Okay, so I just, the last thing I, I wanna say before I hand this over, um, I think I'm handing it over to you next. No, I'm not, I'm gonna keep talking. So um, these were some of the questions that really came up pretty quickly. You know, when is proctoring absolutely necessary? So again, to, to take you back into the context, um, an online, uh, sorry, an in-person exam is always automatically invigilated at Concordia. So the students come in, they show their, their uh, ID cards, they're assigned a seat. We have procedures that have been in place for uh, a very, very long time. And there are invigilators that wander around the room looking to see if um, students are, are following the rules. Um, <clears throat> This was an assumption by our, our faculty that when we made the transition to an online exam, that would follow. It just went with their way of thinking. And we had to really push our community, as no doubt many of you did, to think about other ways of actually assessing our students uh, to ensure that they've met the learning outcomes of the course. And, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were um, uh, facilitating uh, the ease with which they were um, making this transition. Um, but it wasn't an easy ride because, of course, the faculty had one way of assessing in their minds. Um, so the one thing that also came up was whether or not exams were, in fact, the best way to do that. So I'm going to um, just slide. We've been given a five-minute warning. We're, we have five minutes? Okay. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay. We're going to speed this up a little bit. Um, so I just wanted to show you that this was what we built in Coal 2.0. Um, we uh, were able to really, we were very much inspired by Menash and the system that they had built, um, which was really geared towards the student experience. Um, so we had, you know, easy exam and navigation, for instance. Uh, we had ways of, uh, for the students on the number three on the bottom to uh, click if they wanted to come back, a, a way to indicate that they wanted to come back and take a look at that question again. Um, we had uh, opportunities for the students to highlight questions. We had, in some cases, uh, uh, case studies that the students were writing their exams on, and so they needed to be able to highlight information or somehow note important information. It's, uh, that's also a very common tool for students with disabilities that they learn to highlight uh, key pieces of information. A timer was up in the top uh, so that the students knew how much time came back and uh, how much time they had remaining in their exam, which was really critical because in some cases their whole screen was locked down so they couldn't actually check elsewhere and weren't supposed to have anything else available around them. Uh, and when that went down or if that ever glitched, holy cow, did that ever create huge problems for the students. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. So we, had a, we also had a hybrid question type where people were able to upload photos of submissions. I'll just jump through that. That's, it's a topic in itself. Um, we, used a, we used a chat ops approach to supporting the, um, 
the students while they're in exams, because this was high stakes in the sense that people needed to be able to reach out and get assistance during their exam in a real way. Not open a ticket, not we'll get back to you when we can. So there was a team of operators and academic staff and technology people who were absolutely at the keyboard, ready to engage and communicate with the students while this was happening. And we used a really, uh, a really, it worked really well towards then, essentially using Teams or Slack or uh, Matrix to do that. We use Rocket Chat now, okay. I might jump through this and just drop to the next one. So I just wanted to talk a wee bit about proctoring from the technology point of view and from the perspective of a service provider, because it is technology in many ways. Um, is, you know, someone said to me once, you know, what is an airline sale? And people say, uh, you know, service and reliability and prestige. But, you know, the answer I liked was an airline sale's arrival time, right? So in that same way, what is a technology proctoring solution selling your institution? Now, the, the perception that will want to be seeded often is it will stop people cheating in exams, right? It will catch out the people who are, who are trying to violate my academic integrity. But in reality, it's not quite like that, right? Like the, an, an organization can't outsource the ability of identifying, processing, and, and excluding students from your university at, you know, to an external provider. It just doesn't work that way. There's process, there's right of appeal, there's, there's a validation of the evidence. Um, for example, in a real exam, in-person exam, if someone's caught with a piece of paper or a phone and they caught cheating, they'll probably be picked up and they'll be walked out of the exam, right? Whereas in, in many of the proctoring tools, they allow you to do that. They allow you to boot people out as soon as they are detected to be cheating. And you think, well, that's a good idea. But in reality, it's a terrible idea because in, this, in the instance that you exclude anyone falsely, uh, they have huge amounts of appeal. They're very, very upset. You're going to have to give them another exam. There's a lot of false positives with um, proctoring solutions for legitimate reasons, especially during COVID. Someone walked into the room and they talked to them. And also, the person sitting in an exam in a, in, a, in a remote situation, even if they are cheating, they don't actually affect the rest of the people sitting in the exam. So that's not, an, that's not an obvious thing when you start out with proctoring solutions, but they're very, very different. What I think proctoring solutions sell, actually, is part of the ingredient uh, that universities need to be able to make sure their academic integrity is, enti is enticed and that they can demonstrate the steps they took in the instance that there are accusations of cheating. It's not perfect, right? It's to some degree a compliance exercise and it is only a part of the solution. Uh, we also did a tier one support engagement. I haven't got a lot of time. We learned a lot about providing tier one support support we sort of got it sort of got thrown into the engagement at the beginning catalyst providing tier one support we generally have nothing to do with this we set up a team we hired people in uh, Canada we just let them loose on the students and you know it was not a traditional call center experience but what we learned was is that you know someone with a bit of empathy context understanding what people are calling about and some good communication and the team actually worked quite well, right? Um, you know, I'll give you an example of one of the situations we faced, because there were some very unhappy students sometimes for valid reasons. In Montreal, where Concordia is located, they have power issues during lightning storms. So we got calls into our, and I, I, was, a, I was an operator myself a couple of times because we didn't have enough operators, and they, the people would lose their electricity because of power storms. And that would, they would call the hotline and say, I help, 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 I've lost my internet, I can't do my exam. And we had to deal with that. And the if you were empathetic, if you, if, you got people, if you got back to people and if you told them the truth, you actually got a long way towards keeping people happy. So I think we're on to... Well, I don't know. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, the chat. The thing that we also learned was that from a phone, from a phone approach to a... A chat bot, like it wasn't a chat bot, you were actually talking to uh, a person behind the scenes. Chat bot worked a lot better in the sense that one operator could deal with multiple students at the same time and you had much better audit trail, right? And on our actual 1-800 number, what we did was, is we left the queue message was, please use the chat in the application, right? Did you know there was a chat? Why don't you go there? D please don't call us. Because one operator, <laughs> politely, one operator can only talk to one student and sometimes those students want to talk for quite a long time. Right, so the, the chat, the rolling out the AWS Connect chatbot was, real, was a real powerful tool. And you know, there's a lot of cutting and pasting with messaging, which worked well. So I think that's probably us. Thank you, yes. You just wanted to let you go as far as you could there. Anyone have any questions for this presentation? We have a few minutes. Just raise your hand. We'll send you the mic. Thank you. Um, 
Abongile from uh, University of South Africa. Um, the, the, the lady mentioned um, something interesting um, that when they were rolling out proctoring, one of the issues that they had to grapple with um, was the fact that they had to deal with organized labor or unions. So if you can just <laughs> provide a high level account of, I mean, the exact issues um, that you grappled with when you were engaging organized labor and how those were mitigated. Thanks. Sorry, I wasn't able to catch the gist of the question. It was about the labor unions. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so we're, um, like many universities in Canada, a very highly unionized um, uh, campus. We have, I think at Concordia, we might have a record. I'm looking at my colleagues uh, from other Montreal universities here. I think we have 30 different unions on our campus. Uh, and one of them is for invigilators. Um, and what that meant was, <clears throat> Um, an invigilator's role is clearly defined and it has a set uh, uh, list of duties that basically goes from one semester to the other because the, the, the work doesn't really change. When we were planning to do this online and we're, in fact we've moved towards the system with a, in a live, in person, but on the computer written online exam, so uh, it's, we call them a mixed mode because they're actually online, but they're live in the room. We, we were able to, for instance, shift those union duties, uh, but that took a lot of negotiation and time with, with the union. So uh, to have put them online would have meant that we would have to understand, first of all, the role, what was the scope of the duties that they would have. We'd have to list them and then get the agreement of the union and, of course, then with the labor relations team, understand if there was going to be an impact on, on how much they were paid. So because the scope of the duties were completely different, we couldn't just hire a pool of uh, invigilators that we had used previously. Um, we've now done that, but it, it takes time. Uh, so in, in the context of the pandemic, there was really no time to do very much. Um, and so we ended up using um, the automated proctoring solution. And as Andrew said, there are a lot of issues with it. Um, our, our legal team um, has found it very interesting. Um, there are, in, in my own view, the most profound challenge is the availability of the video to the student themselves to, so that they themselves can review the video in the preparation. We have a, a tribunal system. Uh, where any student who's caught cheating um, uh, has the opportunity to present a case in their defense. And um, with Proctorio, there's no way for us legally, we can certainly do it illegally, um, to actually take the video and share it with the student, which, uh, you know, is really, uh, it's the foundation of why we have the tribunal system, that they're able to review the evidence against them and then can adequately prepare the case. So I hope that answers your question, though, about the, about the union. Thanks. Uh, I have a question, Sebastian Abetschnik from the University of Klagenfurt in Austria. Um, we switched completely to proctored exams, and one huge topic um, was the change of grades. And so so how, the, how the grades looked like in a written exam or an oral exam before. We also had um, computer exams in place, um, and yeah, the, the exam grades, they changed. And we had to argue sometimes where these changes are coming from, so I would be really curious yeah. if you have had the chance to evaluate. Yeah, that, yeah. that's a, a very um, complex question. Uh, I, I have been stressing with our colleagues, um, with my, my uh, fellow faculty members, that um, looking straight across from uh, grades from one year to another is, is not an appropriate way to be able to assess uh, whether or not we've got grade inflation because of online proctored exams, right? So yes, we've got grade inflation, 100%, but if you've moved the entire modality of the course online, um, then many, many, many factors have changed all at once. And so to really be able to review that would require you know, a, a really sustained look 
we made lots of adjustments when we went online, right? We made lots of adjustments to assessing in different ways. And so to say that it's because of online proctored exam, I just don't think we have the right evidence to be able to support that. It may well be that case. Um, but I don't think that we've, um, in the interest of, oh, I don't want to call it science, because I don't, but, you know, it, it's teaching after all. It's not scientific in that sense. But I do think that we haven't exactly established that no other parameters have also changed, right? So the modality changed, the way to teach changed, the flexibility changed. Um, we really, it was a great opportunity for us to roll out um, uh, uh, universal design for learning without calling it universal design for learning because all we had to say was be flexible, show your students uh, that you can take their assessments in a variety of different ways, et cetera, right? So, I don't think we've got quite the right evidence, but we are um, certainly looking to ensure that we're maintaining rigor, um, but remembering, you know, one of the core, I mentioned universal design for learning because one of the core principles is that when you're, when you're actually conducting an assessment, you're, you're looking to see that the students have met their learning outcomes, right? That they've reached the competencies that you were expecting for them to, 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 to reach. You can do that in a variety of different ways. It doesn't have to be done in one single modality, right? Uh, it's not just exams. And so what we've been saying is, how else can we do this, right? Are there other ways in which we can do that? Like even when you're wanting to run an exam, how else can you organize the exam? Um, and some of that can also help to take some of the ease off of the proctoring, the reliance on the proctoring for the academic integrity. So no one wants to reduce the rigor, no one wants to um, uh, not uphold academic integrity in the university, but how we do that, um, but that requires a sustained conversation. And unfortunately in the pandemic we didn't really have uh, much opportunity for that. It's a great question. Yeah.